So I'm calling to order this planning commission meeting at six o'clock on August 17th, 2021. Uh, please join me in standing to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So our next item is the consent calendar. Uh, would Madam Chair, roll call, I believe. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Painter, could you please call roll? <laughs> Member Friend. Yes. Member Friend. <laughs> Vice Chair Godberg. Here. Member Keeney. Here. Member List. Here. It record reflects that uh, Chair uh, Lepper is not here this evening. Uh, so moving on, our next item is the consent calendar. Motion to adopt. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Okay. Is that for just the agenda or the consent? Uh, the agenda and the meeting minutes. I will abstain since I uh, can't approve the meeting minutes from the last meeting, so I abstain. Okay, so uh, one abstention by Member Keeney, mm -hmm. and everybody else here's here was yes. <laughs> uh, so moving on to items of interest to the public. Um, we have no members of the public in our audience tonight, so um, I think I will move on from that item. Uh, communications, uh, Mr. Painter, do we have any uh, communications? We have no communications that are not in your packet tonight. Okay. Um, so moving on then to our public hearings, uh, we have our draft 2021 through 2029 housing element update, general plan amendment. Uh, is there a staff report on this item? Yes, there is. And also, as I mentioned to some of the members earlier, we do have some of the documents that uh, we can bring up as as needed. If you want to look at a particular page or uh, discuss a particular aspect of not only the housing element draft, but the addendum uh, and the letter from HCD. So tonight you're being asked to conduct a public hearing to receive public comments. Um, on the city initiated amendment to the general plan. And once again, this is called the draft 2021-2029 housing element update. You're also asked to consider that public comment uh, received, uh, then make findings and then forward a recommendation by minute order to the city council on the housing element update, as well as the addendum that staff's prepared for the uh, update, which is an addendum to the 2013-2021 housing element negative declaration. Uh, once again, this, ad this addendum would address the housing element before you this evening, the 2021-2029 housing element. Um, w due to the lack of public in the audience tonight, I I'm, I'm gonna skip over the basics of why we're here, but in general, the city has a general plan in which is the guiding document that uh, all development within the city as well as other uh, functions of the city work under. One of those elements is the housing element, which is a mandatory element under state law. Uh, per state law, the city's housing element must be updated every eight years. And in order for the city to remain on that eight year update cycle and to avoid having to update the housing element every four years, the uh, city council must adopt a housing element update by September 12th next month for the sixth cycle, which once again is the 2021 to 2029 planning period. All housing elements within the state must be sent to the State Department of Housing and Community Development, otherwise known as HCD, for their certification. And what a certification or a certified housing element does for the city is that it may allow the city to be eligible for future state funding for a variety and various community development purposes. 
uh, grant monies. The organization of the element before you tonight is uh, mimics and follows the framework organization of the general plan itself. So there really are two components of the general plan, a policy document where goals and policies and implementation programs are placed, and then the background uh, report or pack background document where the information that um, is placed regarding how we uh, derive the goals and policies and the direction the city is moving forward with its implementation. So all the background material, all the data, uh, and the analysis of where we, uh, where we were and where we're going uh, and going forward from, from here. The, um, the, the main component of the housing element in terms of the city's responsibility is what's called its, its RENA or its Regional Housing Needs Assessment. And that is derived uh, out of uh, SACOG, which is the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. They are, by statute, required to develop a, a plan, a regional housing needs plan, uh, for all the jurisdictions within the, the uh, SACOG region. And then, w out of that plan, there is a, a certain quantity of housing that our jurisdiction is, uh, needs to plan for over the next eight years. That information was provided in the staff report and a total of 259 units are uh, programmed for us to plan for. And plan for in this context means to not only provide physical land area to accommodate those units, but also in the housing element itself, there are requirements to reduce constraints to the development of this type of housing to serve the various income levels. Also to remove uh, and lower and try to facilitate the additional housing that uh, the city needs to plan for uh, for the next eight years. The RENA breakdown of those 259 units, 56 are required to be, to be planned for the very low income category, which is the income levels that are less than 50% of the counties, El Dorado counties, uh, median income. 34 units for the low income category. Low income in this case means 51% to 80% of the county's median income. 50 units for the moderate income category. And that uh, span is 81% to 120% of the county's median income. And the upper, or excuse me, above moderate income category, uh, we need to plan for 119 units. So on pages four and five of the staff report provides the summary of that RENA numbers. And this is a reduction from the previous eight year cycle. Um, and that's also notated in your staff report. So the city's strategy going forward is involves implementation programs I, I briefly mentioned before. And these programs address for the eight year period, uh, making sure we have land inventory to meet our fair share of housing needs to facilitate the development of housing for special needs households, such as lower income households, those with disabilities, seniors, veterans, large families, female headed households, those needing shelter, as well as farm workers. Strategy also uh, affects and proposes um, the ability to preserve existing housing stocks. So there are programs devoted to that. There are programs related to conserving existing affordable housing opportunities to promote energy conservation. And uh, as I mentioned before, to remove constraints to the development of housing whenever, whenever possible. There are also some additional housing uh, programs related to fair housing and this is a new under new state law the uh, all jurisdictions in California uh, after the first of this year when their housing elements come due they must uh, 
they must develop a uh, fair housing assessment of their individual jurisdiction. And uh, our review of that as, as evidenced in the staff report as well as the housing element draft before you, the city has a, de a developed uh, strategy with programs that address fair housing issues related to discrimination, uh, that, that provide educational materials and provide resources regarding fair housing rights and the responsibilities and services of uh, landowners and um, property managers, as well as to promote a, to facilitate public engagement periodically on fair housing issues, as well as close gaps in and to promote fair housing access uh, to opportunities within the community. As I mentioned earlier, briefly, the, the city uh, has, uh, staff has prepared an addendum to the 2013-2021 housing element, uh, negative declaration, and this is a uh, appendix to, to or a, a attachment to tonight's staff report. The addendum demonstrates that the analysis contained in the negative deck adequately addresses the potential physical impacts associated with the implementation of the proposed housing element update and that none of the conditions described in the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines section 15161, which if they did, they would require a uh, sub, uh, subsequent EIR or negative declaration, but the city uh, understands and believes that none of those uh, conditions described in, the, in that section apply to this particular element. The policies included in the element are designed to bring the city into compliance with state law uh, or to increase the availability of housing sites. Attachment B is that uh, addendum for your consideration tonight and recommendation to the city council. The city did receive a public comment and it was received after staff had prepared the staff report. So analysis of that was not provided. However, the comments were as a memorandum and attachment to your, your packet tonight. Um, those comments were received from Pat and Don Bandekar, and uh, they do address the, uh, the administrative draft 2021-2029 housing element that went to HCD. So staff tonight is recommending once again that the commission conduct a public hearing to receive public comment regarding the city initiated amendment to the general plan housing element. In this case, it's called the draft 2021-2029 housing element update. Then consider that public input received, then make findings and then forward a rec your recommendation by minute order to the city council on the element update, as well as the addendum uh, to the negative deck from 2013. Vice Chair Gottbuck, that concludes my staff report. Um, are there any questions by commissioners to staff? Madam Chair, I'm, I'm gonna make a, a suggestion if my fellow commissioners are, are agreeable that we move directly to the public hearing, open the public hearing for the members of the public to comment, close the public hearing, and then we can discuss and then further suggest that having been gone through this exercise before, we really just go page by page, and if a commissioner has a question or a comment, then we just do it that way. Otherwise, we'll be all over the map. So that would, that would be my suggestion. Does anybody else have? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a... That's <laughs> that does uh, streamline the process, uh, unless there is uh, something that uh, a question... It helps you understand the whole document of staff right at this moment. <laughs> nope. I think I'm, that's a good way to proceed. Okay. I will uh, proceed then to public comment. Um, if any member of the public would like to address the commission on this item, please approach the podium. You will have three minutes to speak. Um, is there any member of the public wishing to address the commission at this time? It appears I'm your only public tonight, Sue Rodman, resident of Placerville. This is so important for our city to have a good housing plan because 
the way cities work is based on how they structure their neighborhoods and their business districts and so that the two are coordinated and make the make Placerville a pleasant place to live so I'm I think that what's been done so far that I've seen of this housing plan looks pretty good um, I'm pleased to see them working towards some very low and low income housing places. I, th I read the public inputs from the letter that was received and I would agree with those. I think those were good, good solid input. Um, and so I'm happy to see this going forward. I would hope that if if it's in the purview of this that we be sure to keep our our uh, ban on having airbnbs in residential neighborhoods i think that's so important i have a friend who lives in tahoe and has seen his neighborhood destroyed by these airbnbs he used to know the neighbors on both sides he used to know the guy across the street and the one next to him and he says, since the Airbnbs came in there, you don't know anybody anymore. You don't know whose car that is parked. You don't know the people who are staying up at 2 in the morning making noise. And uh, he said, it's destroyed the fabric of their neighborhoods. And really, it's destroying the whole fabric of South Lake Tahoe. So I hope Plasville does not allow that to happen to us. Property rights are one thing, but the rights of all the people together need to be considered too. So that's pretty much my input for today. Thank you very much for serving on this commission. I think it's really important. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Um, so I'll now bring it back to the commission um, and per the suggestion uh, to kind of start at the beginning of the document. Uh, if I may, uh, yeah. I, have, I have a question um, for staff on page one of seven. This is actually on the staff report. Okay. Uh, and it also kind of carries over to page two of seven of the staff report. Yes. And so, Andrew, at the bottom, the bottom paragraph on page one and then continuing also on page two, there's this reference, and it reads funny to me, but I think it's the way the feds wrote it. Starting in the second sentence, it says, promotes an affirmative furthers fair housing opportunities and then it references on page two in that paragraph required by the federal and this is capitalized affirmative furthering fair housing final rule and so could you explain what that is because it, it it's got a strange name to me i, I didn't look it up I, I i could have looked it up but i didn't what it's referring to in terms of the federal, the, uh, the Housing and Urban Development Department of the federal government, that the year is 2015, they had a, what's called the final rule, which requires local governments that, that seek particular funding for uh, particular housing projects in order to assist them, well, let me rephrase. The, the, rule ha the rule has to do with a certain parameters that local governments must follow in order to uh, hopefully obtain funding to serve uh, the needs uh, of housing under HUD. HUD does uh, process quite a, quite a lot of housing de development monies although less so in the last administration. I believe this, the new administration may uh, find that to be a little, a little bit more uh, robust. But the, diff the, the reason that is mentioned like that is because there was some worry in California, the California legislature, that the, the federal government was no longer going to proceed with, with the fair housing program or uh, extremely re reduce the amount of funding that would be dedicated to that purpose. 
the state legislature basically adopted the language that that that's mentioned in those paragraphs and it now requires the local government cities and counties in California as I mentioned briefly earlier that when uh, local jurisdictions update their housing elements after January 1 of this year and clearly we fall under that threshold uh, we have to prepare a fair housing assessment within the city based on that federal rule if you want me to distill further than that, that, that might take quite a discussion, but, but I think you perhaps get the idea that the distinction is California, it's codified in statute that the, um, the language would change in the government code and I think the health and safety code regarding this particular federal rule and the definitions that they use so we've based the state legislature adopted by the governor has codified that information and so we must follow in our analysis and our assessment must follow that that guiding document from this 2015 time frame that's a long-winded answer i'm sorry <laughs> okay uh, michael if i uh, may i i think I, I struggled over the same thing and uh, I think part of the problem is maybe there's a typo and the word should be affirmatively. I, I understand uh, what the staff report is trying to convey. Uh, you're telling us, it, um, you're, you're kind of quoting from uh, government code, I think it's 655A3. And yeah. I see that on the second page of the attachment that we got from um, the reviewers at HCD. And, and they're just quoting the government code and it says, affirmatively further fair housing in accordance with chapter 15. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the government code that I, I think Andrew's trying to uh, explain to us how there's both a federal and a state. But they use this um, language. I found it kind of difficult. I, I, once I read through it a couple times, I understood what they meant, but it is a, a strange way to put it. But I think they're, the idea is to that the program promotes and affirmatively furthers fair housing so does that help you at all? Yeah, because that's so it's in an action oriented way. So you're you're furthering fair housing and the and, and you're doing it affirmatively, which means that's an action so, kind of okay. And I, I understand the elements too, as, I'll look up. As yeah. I looked at the fair housing element, I realized that this is this is a new um, a new component and uh, the state is very concerned about it. so I think I, I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to uh, try to use their same language so that they they know that we recognize the importance that they place on this. So I hope that helps. Thank you. And Director Rivas and I were talking about, perhaps it would be clear if we added L-Y after that word, then it would be consistent throughout. Is that affirmatively? Even though probably grammatically, that's probably not the correct way of doing it's, that. But it's it difficult, a, yeah, other than uh, <laughs> every time calling out A, was Put it, it A-F-F-H? Yeah. It, it is a, a, it's difficult to, we, Make we it will read in the narrative that you're referring to uh, the title of the uh, government code section. <clears throat> we will make that edit if that's. Are there additional questions on the staff report? Um, I, I, I set my comments up entirely different than you guys are talking. So I'm kind of uh, out of sync with what I was planning on talking about. Um, I don't, if you want to continue this way, I will jump in when I get to those things. But uh, uh, I, I set up to talk about the um, housing element draft and the things in it first and then go to the, the staff report. So. Well, it sounds like we're done with the staff report, which yeah. brings us to your, which brings us to your presentation. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So I think then moving on to the uh, draft housing element update, um, it looks like we would be starting with housing goals and policies, uh, goal A. So I think if there are comments or questions that commissioners have related to goal A of goals and policies.
Madam Chair, I think if we do that, we're going to be here for hours and hours. Um, I think maybe what we need to do is each commissioner go through the items that they have and then if you see that I say something that duplicates what you're going to say, then, then skip that, okay, instead of doing item for item because this is a very large document. That doesn't bother me. That, that, that's okay. absolutely fine as well. Yeah, I'm, 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 fine, with that too. I'm fine with switching to that. <laughs> um, so we can go ahead and let whoever would like to start. Well, uh, I, I have minimal comments. Okay. That, uh, so on page, oh, geez, goal C, goal C, item policy four, this is dealing with the hillside development standards. I didn't entirely understand. Page number on that? I, I don't have a page number. That's, oh, I'm sorry, page six. Page six. I forgot. Page six, goal C, policy number four. I didn't, so this policy will be removed. So this is a change. Um, and if I, I just want to make sure that I understand. Actually, I don't understand, so I, I kind of need to explain because I, it, well, I'm hoping that the result is we're minimizing cuts in, in hillsides. We've had some projects come before us, and I know I, I've always wanted the development to go with the land so it looks like it fits as opposed to mass pad grading kind of approaches. So I, I'm not sure what we're talking about here. Can, can I have you repeat? The page number? Yeah, page six. Page six of the policy document or? Page six of the addendum, I think. Right, we're still in the addendum. Yeah, I think you're on page six of the addendum in the staff page six report, of the addendum? not the. Oh, okay. It's oh. where he's commenting. Okay, so <laughs> we, we've already changed direction again. So um, yeah. do you want to talk about the addendum now instead of the housing okay. element? I, I'd be fine to, to answer those questions, but. Well, I, he, he's going to ask his questions and we'll move oh, on. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's kind of how we, we thought we might do it. All right. C so can you just explain this one for me, please? Can you find it? Yeah, I'm going to bring it up. So oh, okay. Page six, policy four. Yes. Okay. Uh, to help you understand what this table, maybe that's that's what would help. I, ju I just want to know, it says the policy will be removed, and then there's kind of a discussion. I, I, yeah. I, I'm unclear as to what the final outcome of this suggestion is. Uh, I, it was not carried over to the current or the update in front of you tonight. And, and the result of that is what? Well, by, by removing the policy, um, staff, it's staff's opinion, such a policy does constrain the development of housing because it limits, perhaps limits where and how much and what density the city uh, can achieve. Um, however, the city does respect and have certainly the authority to review under any development project um, those efforts or those uh, outcomes of a potential development project as it affects, you know, aesthetics, visual character, et cetera. So let, me, so let me make sure I understand then. Basically, we're saying that the policy that restricts development on, on hillsides, hillside development, is uh, tying up a lot of land that otherwise could be used to meet our arena requirements, right? Is available land, so we're going to we're going to remove that restriction on hillside development, but we'll replace it with, and that's what's not clear, I guess. We we will replace it with standards necessary to retain aesthetic and character of the city by minimizing cuts and fill. So so I guess that last part by minimizing cuts and fill on slow properties seems to me to be in conflict with removing the policy and thereby allowing cuts and fills. Do you follow what I'm saying? Perhaps I misspoke. The, the policy calls for the city to review the standards 
The city is not proposing to change the standards after our analysis, so maybe I misspoke. Okay. We are just not carrying forward this policy to the next housing element. But we are not amending the provisions of the hillside development standards. There are no changes proposed to those. You're removing the review. We're removing, removing the policy review, yes. Okay. Of course, the commission as a group, if you feel that is important, we could retain it and add it back in. I'm still unclear what removing the policy, re what the, the, the result will be of removing the policy review. If, if you're telling me, look, we're, we're still not going to, uh, we're, we're still, God, we're still going to review <laughs> the project and, you know, and we're going to have the standards. I, it's just very unclear to me how this is laid out. And it's something I think that's pretty important, you know, for aesthetics and character. So I'm, I'm not opposed to building on hillsides, but I think how it's done is very important. But the, the standards remain. Yes. Okay, so. Okay, the standards remain. Uh -huh. So what am I losing here? Chair, if I can try and point out, maybe try and simplify this. Basically, policy four is directing staff to do a review of the hillside development standards okay. as a way of reducing cost. But I would say that's a two-edged sword. Typically, when you're looking at doing uh, cuts and fills or work on steep slopes, you're increasing the cost of that development. Mm -hmm. So to make you feel better, because it seems like your primary uh, concern, uh, if I may, Commissioner Friend, was is this going to hamper the city's ability to provide affordable housing? Staff uh, did a thorough analysis, and we determined that we have adequate acreage lands that are zoned and designated for affordable housing to meet our arena numbers through the planning uh, time horizon all the way through 2029 regardless of whether we look at the slope issue or not okay so, so in other like words we don't we, need to look at the slope issue no but i just want to make sure that because my real concern frankly is is the ultimate aesthetic mm -hmm impact that, that's all I'm, I'm right and I know that's very very important with the city we have um, sections in our development standards that require that we look at slopes and ridge lines and those kinds of things okay. retainment of trees and other aesthetics and so um, but I just want you to be sure that that's not impeding the city's ability to provide for affordable housing staff did a very thorough what we call an achievable density analysis where we look at the various constraints so that we're not going to apply or we're not going to state that the, on, on these particular parcels we'll be able to achieve our required densities uh, to provide for affordability if they can't be developed at a certain density so we went through that analysis and I think hopefully that I can, we can get more in the weeds but I think you're, that, you're that safe. makes perfect sense thank you much and thank you for the indulgence uh, Commissioner list okay um, looking at the uh, housing element draft, um, I would like you to find page uh, B85. We'll look at B85 and B2. B85, we have an overview of the numbers that responded to the questionnaire. We had a total response of 215. 175 were non-Hispanic whites. 26 were and that was 87%, and we have 26 uh, non-whites for 12%. If we go over to, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, if we go over to B2, um, B2, the population of the city by race, uh, figures are based on non-Hispanic or Latino and Hispanic or Latino. This chart shows that 87% of the population is non-Hispanic or non-Latino and 12% are Hispanic. We go back over to, to 85 and um, on 85, once again, it says that 87% uh, are non-Hispanic or Latino and 12% are Hispanic. We get down to the bottom of the second paragraph 
I'm, I'm all right with those figures, okay? Uh, my problem is with the summation at the bottom of the, of the second paragraph. It says, this indicates that non-white residents are overrepresented in compared to their share of the broader population. Underrepresented, it says. Underrepresented, excuse me. Non-whites are underrepresented. Um, I would like to have that statement removed because if we look at it, we're seeing that it's exactly the same numbers, seven, uh, 87 and, and 12. Um, staff like to comment on that? Is your question, what is the value of that statement? The last I, sentence? I don't, like the, I don't like a statement that's put in there that isn't factual. And in this case, in my opinion, that's not factual because I'm looking at the, at the two charts and the two charts are giving me the same information. Yeah, so I would concur. I don't, I'm not sure I understand why that sentence is in there. Okay. Is, uh, um, I'm not sure what you're, are, are you saying that they're un, underrepresented in our population? In this, whoever wrote this last statement is saying that the Hispanic population, in this case, is underrepresented. And if, and but if they're we talking look about at their, underrepresented in the survey questionnaire. Yeah. But that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think that's. But, that, but they're that's the, exactly the same percentages. I don't believe that they are. So the the white population on page B two is seventy eight no, percent. No, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It says non-Hispanic and Latino. So they're taking all of those together. This on, is saying on, the non-white residents. On here, on Are, page, on B2, okay? It says non-Hispanic and Latino, and then it says Hispanic and Latino. Okay, you see that? It's like an 81 and 19, pretty much. 81 and... Um, 19. Well, it's, if you go clear to the, to the 14 to 18, clear on the right, it's 87 and 12. Then if you go over to page, so the, oh, but that's the, the county, but that's the county. Yeah, I mean, so this says, this says on page B2, the only non-white population with substantial number is Hispanic and the Latino population makes up 19%, and only 12% of non-whites responded to the survey. So that is a correct sentence because it's less than 19%. But when I'm looking, I just want to point out that make sure you're looking at the city of Placerville portion of that table as opposed to El Dorado County. So El Dorado County's portion of the table is on the right and the city of Placerville is on the left. So the total non-Hispanic Latino. Okay, so we have 80% we have instead of 87%. Right non-Hispanic and Latinos and 19% Latinos. But that still matches, 81 and 81 still match. Um, and 26 residents. Well, table one. I just, pro I just think this, I, I just think that last statement is, I, I don't know, I, I, I feel like it's, it's, um, it's saying something about our community that isn't there. And and I and I don't like that. On page B two, it says that. There's believe? no no the, the last the, sentence on. B, uh, this B85. is on B uh, B eighty five, second paragraph at the bottom. This indicates that non-white residents are underrepresented compared with their share of the broader pop population. I I, th I think this gets to Vice Chair Gottberg's point is that. The statistics that are brought up on B85 have to do with the respondents to the questionnaire and not necessarily the population at large. It's, those have to do with the respondents to the question. Yeah. But I think the sentence is saying that the responses, responses. They, were, they were un unrepresented compared to their share of the broader population. The share of the broader population is this 19.1%, correct? That's yeah. Hispanic Latino is 19.1%. And then the responses was only 12.1%. Yeah. 
right? That, but that, that's, I, I, I don't like that last sentence because underrepresented, it kind of means like, well, we're ignoring some people. Folks had a choice whether they responded. So I don't, Absolutely. I, I don't, I don't think that sentence is correct. You could say, it'd be accurate to say that fewer, that fewer non-white uh, individuals completed the survey uh, compared to their share of the broader population. That's true. But to, to say that underrepresented, I don't think, is fair because I, I would presume that everyone had an equal opportunity to respond to the survey. So the underrepresented, to me, would suggest that there was unequal opportunity to participate in the survey, to participate in the government. Really, this is a right. government yeah. process. I, Absolutely. I disagree. Really I, I, I think you're reading way too much into yeah. the word underrepresented. Underrepresented. I think uh, it's a factual statement. We've got 12.1 percent of the respondents, as opposed to the overall population, as you pointed out correctly. It's 19.1. Uh, um, it's just a fact, uh, and, and we're talking about a survey. We're uh, the results of the survey and the public opinion, so. It, yeah, it is, it is uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, yes, please go ahead. I think here. I want to clarify something. So I'm looking at an appendix, page B2, uh, table one. Uh, that is that is census data. So that's something, that's a very large pool of whoever submitted the census sure. data. Going back to page B85, we're making that statement because that's based on uh, the folks that responded to the survey. So those figures are not related. The survey was meant to uh, garner public um, uh, responses to the, the, the housing and different questions. It's not, it's very, it could be very different than the census data. They're not no. going to be alike. T to totally, totally agree with that. I, I think my, my issue, and I, I share Commissioner List's issue is the word underrepresented I think can be in fact interpreted to mean something other than perhaps what it is meant here and therefore we can be clearer in our diction it would be more precise to say that fewer non-whites responded in the survey or participated in the survey or provided responses compared to their share in the broader population. That would be precisely accurate. The word underrepresented is not precise. It can have different meanings. And, and, and so I think let's just be precise. We're saying that way there, there's no mistake about what we're saying. Underrepresented is suggestive. So in other words, you think saying underrepresented gives a feeling like there was some bias in the survey or something that caused that particular group to exactly. be it not representative the in the survey. Yes, it can raise okay, the question. Okay, if you, uh, I could, I could see that. Do we have, do we have a, a fix or a suggested language change? Something along That's the lines. Help us, help us. Uh, something with along this. the lines of uh, fewer non-white repres uh, residents participated in the survey compared to the share of the broader population. And then there, therefore, their views are underrepresented uh, or right. we could yeah. say we could leave it more open-ended. I, I, I would accept that their this viewpoints may be underrepresented compared to their share of the broader population. That's because what follows is uh, the results of the survey, and we have uh, summary statements on what the uh, respondents indicated are their concerns uh, regarding fair housing. So I, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. We, I, I don't know that there is bias uh, to, but the, the fact is that fewer uh, non-white, non-Hispanic white respond. There were fewer non-Hispanic white respondents. Um, yet it does not res reflect their percent of our overall population. Uh, but I think what the authors are trying to 
indicate to the reader is that as you read the results of the survey, keep in mind that their viewpoint may be un underrepresented. I think that's important to keep in there. That, so their viewpoint may be underrepresented as you look at may the numbers that follow. May not be sufficiently captured. Sufficiently. I, I disagree because you, you, you send a survey out and you take whoever responds to that survey and you deal with that data. If, if you're gonna say, well, gee, I've gotta have X number of, of this yes. race of people and this race of people and this race of people, or otherwise it doesn't make, it, it doesn't work, then, then you're, you're coming up with a solution based on totally on, on race, not on people within the community, from the way I see it. So I, I, I have, you know, the, the other part of this is, here we have this, uh, on, on page B2, we have non-Hispanic and Latino, and then we have Hispanic or Latino, and then we come over here and we, we bring in the non-white residents. I, I really think that that needs to be changed to Hispanic or Latino. So, so it should I, all be consistent. So it would be consistent. It, it, couldn't, couldn't one argue, while, while we're, the, the suggestion is that they're underrepresented, isn't, isn't there another possibility that they have less concern or, or less interest? We, we don't know. We, so we really don't know the reason why there were fewer responses as a percentage of the broader population. We don't know. I mean, it, it could be it's a less concern to them. I, you follow what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying it, we should not be adding the supposition in at this point. I, just state factually what happened. Here are the number of responses, and here's how it breaks down as a percentage of the broader population. We, have, we, have, we know what the census data tells us, and then here's what the, the engagement was. And, and just leave it at that. Because well, as written, it is factual. So I, I, now I'm very confused. No, because to, what you're saying is, is we <coughs> need to take this concern of underrepresentation, and that needs to be kind of an overlay as we go through the rest of the analysis. And I'm saying, well, let's be careful because we don't know what that underrepresentation, we don't know what that disparity in response means. <coughs> we really don't. We, we don't know what it means. If, if in the opening of this statement, it would have said something about, in the city of Placerville, we have X non-Latino, and we have Y Latino, okay? And out of all of these 215 apply, uh, send in a, a response, and of those number, these were this. Then you could say it was underrepresented, but without having a breakdown in here, the population breakdown by race, I, I just feel like that statement is, is incorrect and should not be there. I think staff has a suggestion, uh, suggestion and I we can guess. move forward. We can strike that last sentence completely. It's not gonna affect anything at all. Okay. I would support that. I would support that. Okay, I can too. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on to your next item then. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, on page B94, table 18, goal three, metrics and milestones. Uh, third one down, there's a quote, conduct at least six workshops of fair housing issues and resources. Um, I would like to know what that would what that would look like. What? I'm sorry, Commissioner. Uh, B94. We're on Appendix B-94. Yes, sir. In the right-hand column, third one down. Oh, okay, I, I get you. Okay. I, I see it. Thank you. I, I, I'm just curious what uh, what these six workshops would look like. I. Sure. I'll refer you to the policy document right. Right. and I'll get the page for you.
If, if we have information on the policy documents, just point out the page. You don't have to go over with us. I, okay. On, on page 18 of the policy document is where that milestone is captured. Not verbatim, but the intent is there under uh, program uh, D2, community outreach, where the okay. city will conduct a workshop every two years, starting with next year. Okay. okay. Yeah. But the next step, you're preparing a document to be handed out. What, what's that going to look like? What, give me an idea of... of what this, this document would look like or, or what information you would be going over with um, in terms of uh, sure. fair housing issues and, and resources. Uh, again, we're talking about workshop? Yes. Well, what we envision this workshop to consist of would be to assemble a variety of housing advocates who address this particular or those particular uh, income levels, as well as special interest groups dealing with a variety of special uh, populations, to discuss these matters and also to help educate them. So part of this outreach would be to educate them on what their rights are and what uh, and how if they wanted to file a complaint for, for instance, a discrimination, this would be an educational opportunity to provide them with information where that can be discussed. And some people, uh, we would also, another program deals with actually producing uh, handouts, pamphlets, et cetera, and uh, web access or to our website where this information can easily be obtained. So um, in many cases, there may be, over the, over the next eight years, there may be changes to a apartment block. Maybe the ownership changes and they start to discriminate against folks. Well, having this community outreach gives the community member an opportunity to learn more about what their rights are uh, for that particular instance. So does that, does that help you? Yeah, great, okay. thank you. All right, now, um, there were a number of uh, figures. Let's start with uh, figure C-5, and that's on um, that's on page uh, C6, appendix C6. It says percentage overpayment by homeowners. Can you explain that, please? Uh, no. Oh, C5. I was on C7. Yeah, that's the next one. towards the back of the, <laughs> the, the guide. <laughs> if I can just interject, I think uh, the importance of this, it, uh, this updates our analysis of our housing element and addresses one of the reviewer's com comments, um, HCD, under the fair housing, let's see, um, number three, they're, they're talking about fair housing program, disproportionate housing needs, and this, uh, phrase over pavement and overcrowding. Uh, what the reviewer pointed out was that uh, we, the city needed to provo provide more analysis uh, on these topics. And so I think what this map shows is uh, where the overpayment, yeah, it's generalized to um, occur. And I think the importance of it is to show that we don't have a real trend um, on that or uh, displacement as a result of it, it's uh, simply that it does exist. But uh, Andrew, have you been able to put your fingers on this map and can tell us a bit more? I have, yeah. In uh, section three, the housing needs assessment, we do define what is overpayment 
So that may, may help you with, with, and I'll just, I'll, it's a pretty short section here where it talks about it, but overpayment um, refers to households that pay more than 30% of their monthly income are deemed to, be o to overpay for housing and households that pay more than 50% of their monthly income are deemed to severely overpay for housing. So I think what that, what that particular graph is mentioning is, is the location based on census data where folks, households are degrees of overpayment in terms of their overall income dedicated toward, toward housing. Okay. And I tried to look at this as a novice coming in off the street, mm -hmm. okay? And, and if I looked at that, I'm going, percent overpayment by homeowners. It doesn't give me enough information. Just adding what you said about the 30% of their income on that chart right there would, would clear that up immensely, okay? And I think the same thing for C6, which is the next page um, dealing with uh, uh, renters. Okay, if we, if we had a percentage to work with there, um, that would help to clarify uh, to the person reading this chart what, what that's all about. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, um, hopefully this would be helpful to the commission. We have Appendix A, which is a glossary of terms. This is a huge document. If we were to provide a definition throughout the document, we'd probably increase its size probably substantially. So I want to direct you to appendix page A-8. Both those terms are defined right at the very top. So but you could over, overcrowding is defined by the U.S. Census, a household greater than 1.01 persons per room, excluding bathrooms, kitchens, hallways, and porches. Severe overcrowding is defined as households with greater than 1.51 persons per room. And then right under that, then there's a, a definition of overpayment, which Mr. Painter um, uh, discussed earlier. But you can see all the different terms that are in this. So if there is a term that seems somewhat puzzling, hopefully it's in the Appendix A glossary of terms. To, 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 to be sensitive to the issue you raised, Pierre, though, you could put simply in parentheses C, uh, meaning S-E-E, -S -E -E, C, a2 or whatever, then, th then you can automatically reference it, right, without having to repeat the entire definition right. and therefore increase the size of the document. You've got plenty of room just to say in parenthetically, sure. whatever. That, that might be helpful. I just wanted to make sure you yeah. were aware that right. we have a glossary of terms in the document. Now, now then, then, of course, the question for But a lot of people, I'm sorry. No, sir. go ahead, sir. But a, but a lot of people will turn to, turn to a graph like this and they'll look at it without going to the glossary. And that, would, that was my point. Just, just the sure. simple words, based on 30% of their, of their income on those two charts would, uh, would help immensely on that. And in the term overpayment, what, you know, again, quibbling over words, but it goes back to the adage of champagne taste on a beer budget, right? Okay, you, so you overbought, is, is that another way to say? overbought overpayment so I, I struggle with okay what's the value what's the value then of, of, of presenting the information that way okay I understand the concern that well you know people well, they're spending so much a, such a high percentage of their income on on housing that that part I get but it how we phrase it and you know we're trying to imply things on choices and, and so I struggle with that in terms of how we then set policy because somebody may very well, I really want that house or I want that land and I'm, I'm going to pay for it. I really am. It's gonna no, hurt. that's a very good point. But I just want to, you know, do keep in mind that these definitions are, we cannot change them. Gotcha. Unfortunately. And I, I disagree with, uh, I, you know, I, I know you want to make this more accessible to the person off the street, but I don't think we should take that approach reading a document like this you requires due diligence and study and you you need to have some level of, of background and i think everything is presented in here but to annotate all of the maps uh, with that kind of detail 
really would involve a lot more work, and I appreciate you know that you uh, you saw this and, and flagged that uh, particular matter about overpayment. Uh, that is a very sensitive issue right now because people have, uh, in our economic uh, situation, have maybe gotten themselves into a tenuous uh, situation, paying more than the standard. It's just a rule of thumb with 30% of your income going for housing. That's it, it, um, I've heard that for years. It's explained well elsewhere in the document. And I don't think we should have either staff go back and annotate all the maps with uh, various levels of detail to explain uh, what the ranges are. Uh, that, that's a lot of work. The other way to do it is to have the consultant do it, also a very expensive proposition. I think that instead uh, we should rely on uh, the that the reader is a bit more sophisticated. If they wonder, if they puzzle over what that is, then they need to dig into the document, find that definition that exists. We should I, make sure that the, the glossary has that uh, sufficiently defined so that it can be explained. I, I disagree. Adding three words to that page, those but two three pages. words to that page and three words to every other map. I, I no. mean, I, I, I agree with you, uh, John. Uh, I thought some of the maps could be better explained, but I realize the level of uh, input and cost for that. I, I'm not sure that we're going to uh, realize much gain for that. See right here, it says draft. When you have a draft, that's what you're doing, is you're going back and you're making sure this is the document that you want to put out to the public. And that's why I think we need to do these kinds of things. We need to make sure that the public understands what they're looking at when they do that. And adding those very few words to those pages, um, I don't think is a bur burdensome to anybody. Well, I, I disagree. I think uh, going back and making those annotations to each and every map to make them consistent uh, is, is a bit of a burden and a cost. And uh, again, if, you, if the reader gets into the appendices, that's someone who's already engaged, and I think they will have that background that they need to uh, help them uh, understand what's being presented. Would, would it be possible to have very simply up front, you know, like a, a read me first, right? So to, to anyone who's picking up this document, okay, here are a, a couple of things. Um, note, reference, you know, the, the, the maps to, to the definition. It, any, some, any little set of instructions, for lack of a better term, that might help cover these things without um, the burden of, of doing all the, the labor. I, I agree with, with, with Commissioner List in terms of the clarity and, and being able to understand what that graph is trying to tell you. I'm also sensitive to uh, Commissioner Keeney's concern about the amount of work it would be to get there I'm just thinking there might be kind of a shortcut by simply having a set of instructions on, on, on how to do it, or here are some pieces you need to know, pay particular attention to it. Just a thought. Uh, on that vein, I, I think I can speak for Director Rebos. We, we could certainly add a paragraph into the introduction, section one, that might allude to or mention that uh, terms used in this document may be found in Appendix A. I, I'm assuming that that's the first chapter that they would probably read, but that's... We, we can hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Thank you. I mean, I agree with Commissioner Keeney. I think if somebody's reading this, there's a glossary of terms and there's an ability to find that information. And I don't think it needs to be on every single figure in the entire document as long as it's there. Um, I'm not opposed to putting something up front. Uh, I mean, even potentially in the, I know it's, a, it's in Appendix A at the beginning, which I already feel like is up front, but maybe perhaps before the first of these figures that just says all terms are defined in Appendix, you know, A, page C, A, page A1. And then that sort of takes uh, before you start all of the figures so that people have a reference there. That might be a simple solution that then provides that information if somebody only goes to Appendix B. Um, and doesn't realize that there's a glossary of terms in the document. So, uh, kind of along those lines, again, I'm, I'm thinking of something that starts out as about this document, right? About this, yeah. okay? Because it is massive. This is a tome. This is a massive tome. It's complicated. Um, we want it to be of, of value, okay? Whatever we can do to assist people that are going to use it, 
with their due diligence, right? Because it does take diligence to go through this without question. So uh, just something along those lines. I think we can, we can meet all of the objectives that have been expressed so far. Okay, I have another one. Appendix D, um, housing rental issues. Um, it's on D1. Housing rental issues, affordability, 20, 29% said this was an issue. And my question, and, and I don't think we can answer this, is based on what? Compared to other areas, compared to what they paid in Southern California, um, uh, what they felt uh, a fair, fair should be. There, that, that kind of, uh, kind of an open-ended um, affordability, uh, you know, man, I wish my, uh, I wish my uh, mortgage wasn't as high as it was. Well, because of the house I bought, I, you know, I pay a bigger mortgage. Okay. Um, that's all I have on the, the draft report. The next one I'd like you to turn over in the, the packet to page uh, 23, and um, this is program 13, density bonuses. Am I correct um, that the city fund, general funds could or are being given to developers? The develop, uh, what development standards have been reduced? I'm looking at the I'm looking at the bullet points in the right-hand column. Uh, it says incentives included, but not limited to. Okay. You, you up with me? Yeah, I, I'm on the page, 23. Okay, so, so the questions that go along with this, are, are city general funds being used to give um, bonuses, that's what their terms are, not mine, to, to developers? Or could they be used to? Yeah, the, currently the, the city has no density bonus projects. Okay. Zero. What this is, is mentioning is that these are incentives that the city could employ for someone who wish, wishes to develop under a density bonus program. And it could involve, as the bullet points describe, a reduction in development standards, setbacks, building height, et cetera. It could involve um, some acquiescence on architectural design. The other regula uh, regulatory incentives are, so is that the one you're most concerned about? The use, well, the, potential um, use of funds? Well, it's what possible. Development standards, what development standards are being reduced or changed? What architectural design requirements are being reduced? what regulatory incentives are being proposed? Well, under the state's density bonus provisions, there are some um, incentives that the city must provide. And must meaning the applicant is the one that brings forward which ones that he or she or they wish to deviate from or receive a reduction in or elimination thereof. Um, the city may not have much discre uh, discretion over which ones they can take or which ones they choose to use. Um, because, the, again, really the purpose of the density bonus program is to develop housing and housing at a particular income level, which is what the density bonus law provides. A certain number, certain percentage of the density bonus that's granted can be, well, let me backtrack. The, the provisions allow for, let's say a developer wants to build a 100-unit apartment block, and they want a density bonus. So if they propose to set aside 20 of those 100 units for a particular income level, under the state's density bonus language, you get a certain percentage of density bonus above what would normally be allowed in the zone. The, the interesting thing about the density bonus is the units that that developer could obtain, those do not have to be uh, uh, deed restricted to income level. They could be market rate. 
So the city wins by getting a certain percentage of affordable units, but also perhaps a mixed income community where we get market rate as well. And I think, I know as planners here, we certainly want to encourage a, a variety and a mixed, a mixed income development whenever possible. So these are incentives that, yes, the city could consider and in some cases the city may have to provide. But do they involve financial contributions? Not necessarily. It could be a reduction in, in uh, maybe connections to city water system or the city sewer system as a reduction in cost. Director Rivas, do you have anything to, to add to that? Um, no, I agree with, with, with everything that um, Andrew was saying, but I just want to point out that this particular section of the addendum is a document that was pre uh, prepared in accordance with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. So is the adoption of this, of the new cycle six element um, having a significant effect on the environment? And we relied on the negative declaration that was prepared for the previous housing element. So it takes a look at these programs and policies in terms of its impact on the environment. So I would just direct you to the actual housing element. So for the so if there's an issue regarding program 13 density bonus, it may be worded a little bit different, but I would go to page 2-22 because that is what's proposed for that policy where this it may be focusing more, it may be different in some of the wording there where you'll have a complete um, analysis of the program of, that's proposed. We have a lack section where we indicate whether we're going to continue, modify, or delete the program. So unless you think that we're, we're not considering an environmental impact, then I would just go to the actual housing element policy section as opposed to the addendum. So, so I, did I did highlight this. First of all, I want to say I support mixed development as opposed to concentrated development in one way or the other. I think that's all kind of a good strategy to have, have mixed development. I, I always get concerned when I see reduction in standards, reduction in design requirements. <clears throat> reduction standards, reduction in design, as so on and so forth. So I'm unclear as to how, what, what role the commission plays in the application of the density bonuses, which could include as they're bulleted here in this document, as well as bulleted in the, uh, on page 2-23, I think. So how, what, is, what is our role? Because obviously, you know, I don't want to, I don't like the trade-off or the binary choice of, well, we can get more housing to meet our arena requirements and, and we'll just build these, you know, um, gee, concrete boxes or whatever you want to call it, you know what I'm saying? The character, of the, going back to the character of the city. So it's un, I guess it's unclear to me in this document how, how it relates to what's proposed, how it relates to what we do, what our, what our role is in this. So if we're faced with a density bonus where there's been a reduction in development standards or a reduction in architectural design requirements. How, how does that work with us and our, and our role and, and what we try to do? Well, a project that involves a density bonus would come before you mm -hmm. and staff would illustrate and or describe what incentives that an, a developer would have the right to require of us to provide to them. So those would be things that would be known, known to you as a commission, known to the public, as well as requested by the developer. Um, the key thing under the density bonus state statutes, the city must, must approve a density bonus if it meets the criteria under the statute. The city has no discretion to say no. Okay, so that, that's, you know, that's, that's really important to know. That, that, that's really the nut of the thing, frankly. Part, part of the discussion that staff would have with a developer would be discussing what these incentives that they want and really what we can provide. Um, there may be some, some things that maybe it, it, we just could not provide. 
and perhaps we would al alternatively ask them to choose another. Um, I don't know. We're, we're, this is all hypothetical since we have no projects that I can even go back to. I, certainly during your time, uh, member friend, I don't think there's been a single one. And I've been here 20 years. I, and I vaguely recall one, maybe. And, and that's fine. It's rare. But yeah. you know, this is, this is a, a nine-year, eight-year document. Right, eight years. Eight years. Yeah. So a lot can happen in eight years. Correct. Um, and, and things that HUD's doing, for example, there's a lot of pressures. I think. And so we're the guardian. I, I, you know, we're the guardians here. Frankly, this is going to be a policy document for the next eight years. I realize it's also to show how we're affirmative, affirmatively furthering affirmative, whatever that, <laughs> whatever <laughs> that is. Yeah. Here and here are the things that we can do. I, I get, I get all that. But at the end of the day, I want, I want to know what these things mean. It goes back to the hillside thing that I was concerned about. Th those things are important to me. I want to know what they, what they mean and how, and how they might work. So uh, thanks for the time. Sure. Uh, it w one thing to add, and, and I think Director Rebus can chime in as well, is that one of the programs we have uh, for this particular cycle involves some grant monies that we did receive last year. And we plan to implement and hire a consultant to to prepare uh, for, and you guys would be involved with objective design standards. And when that occurs, then a developer would pick from the various options that may be in that particular set of, of uh, standards to choose from when they build a development project. And so really, your review of a density bonus, when those have been established, will be very minimal because they would have picked from <laughs> picked from their choice of, of uh, if that makes if that makes sense to you. Um, do you have anything to add, uh, Pierre? I think I think that that would that would help you because then all of that role would have been done by you with with your input to develop a set of standards that the city accepts for multifamily and even attached single family uh, homes. No, Andrew is correct. We do have a program where uh, one of one of our objectives is to a way of reducing the cost of housing. Of course, is to um, uh, do the entitlements up front. So we would we would be we are looking at hiring a consultant to do what's called objective design standards, so that um, we'll go through the community process. Uh, the objective design standards will come before you. They'll be site specific. We're looking at three sites. Uh, to develop elevations uh, for those affordable apartment complexes. And the other um, item we would need to do, of course, is CEQA. So, that, so we could have it by right, we'd have to do the CEQA analysis. So the, the, the city is in receipt of additional uh, funding where we're going to hire a consultant to do a CEQA analysis of these three sites. So with, this, with, with the CEQA, with the objective development standards, we can actually then have three sites that will be by right, because that's typically uh, the more difficult hurdle for a developer when they're coming in, uh, looking at investing in a piece of property to develop affordable housing, is not really knowing how you're going to get through the process. It could be long um, and lengthy, and of course, it adds the cost. So I think that's very, that's very important, and I hope that makes all of you comfortable, because the CEQA documents, of course, would come before you, as well as the design standards. And, and having those objective standards helps to reduce the cost of the developer because they, they would not have to come before you for a discretionary review of their elevations because you all and city council would determine what set of design parameters that they would need to adhere to with their submittal. So then it would be more or less a, not an over-the-counter permit, but in, in essence a ministerial permit unless it involved subdivision of land, which uh, that still would go back before you if they were you know, fee simple, fee title, individual lots. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Okay, the next one. Um, in that same document, um, page 27, program 15, permit development impact fees. And in this they talk about uh, uh, payment of fees over 12 months, da, 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 and so on. And my, my response in reading this is, and, and I talked to a, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, could there be a plan put in place where 
the permits and development impact fees could be paid at the close of escrow instead of up front. Uh, this, thus the owner would, uh, the owner, not the builder, would pay uh, that when the mortgage was set. Now, when we stop and think about it, if I'm a builder and I have impact fees, uh, mitigation fees, what, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, okay, I give the city thirty dollars or $40,000 and I start building my building and I'm being charged for that $40,000 that's sitting in the coffers of the city, okay, and if I didn't have to pay that, my cost of building that house just went down a whole bunch, okay? And then I get down to the end, and as a demand on escrow, um, the city then would say, okay, for this house to come out of escrow, it has to, it has to have th these fees paid. Um, I just, I, I talked to a, a good friend of mine that, that worked in escrow, and um, she says, well, I've never heard of anything like that. <laughs> so, but um, we, we talk about postponing for 12 months, and in some cases it'd probably be less if you had a builder come in and, and do that. But go ahead, respond. Sure. Yeah, um, at, at Director Evos actually authorized uh, a developer who's building out, they're nearly done, building out the um, Richard Orchard Hill the portion that been plotted about a decade ago, and so yes, at at, at escrow they do, they do complete the fee uh, requirements. So yeah, that that certainly can be negotiated, and that's certainly under our purview to to do so. So yeah, that's that that does work, and it, and it does uh, occur. We also did that for the Escaton development as well. Oh okay. So I, it's a good program. I I don't know where anywhere it's written. And I've never heard of being used. That that was why I brought that up. Okay. Um, the last one is page 19. And um, that's is that page this, 19 in the uh, secret document? Yeah. Okay. Um, page 19. Quote. Um, in order to maintain acceptable service ratios, response times, and other performance objectives. That's the end of the of, uh, uh, 14A, this is, uh, under public service. The second one down says police protection. Um, under police protection, the box less than significant was marked. Improving the last cycle of housing elements and rezoning of properties at Cold Springs and Middletown Road uh, to allow somewhere around 100 units, and I don't remember exactly the number, it may be less or it may be more, of extreme low-cost housing uh, units. Um, our chief of police stated that uh, this development would have no impact or significant impact um, uh, on on his, on he and his department's ability to provide current service levels for the city. He was right in one thing, he retired. Um, I'm not convinced that a, that a number of low, very low and extreme low cost housing units will have less than significant impact on police services. I therefore request that on page 19, number 14 public service on the line police protection be changed to potentially significant impact from the lesser uh, significance than significant. So this could, this is project specific, this, this is project specific, correct? So, so, so could it not be less, less than significant with mitigation incorporated? So a project comes before you, and, and so there's a valid well, you're, concern. You're looking at the original negative declar declaration document, yeah. right? I, yeah. Right. But now we're at a mitigated, right? So this is evaluating the impact of the housing element itself, not an individual uh, project. And there aren't any projects being proposed. We're, no. We have policies and uh, an implementation plan. 
Absolutely, but, but what I'm saying is the way this form was filled out, okay? This form was it's, filled out on the, the uh, yeah. last dra uh, housing element, not on a specific development. So I think your concern was about a specific development that itself would undergo, or possibly undergo environmental review. But let me uh, just right? let me let me just no, offer let me just offer that if we were to meet uh, our entirety of low and uh, very low income all in one area, for example, that could potentially uh, impact public service. But that's a project. Let me just, that's, no, not, no, no, that's not this. No, 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 actually, that's, that's not a project. It, that could be a whole group of projects. And those would finish. have their own environmental uh, uh, review. They, uh, this, right, this, but, is, this is reviewing the housing element. This is not speaking to individual projects of, of any uh, economic. Uh, I, I, I agree, but you have to take that logic and say, okay, so this is, here, here is our, here's our housing element document. Here are the policies that we're going to pursue. Here's our RENA requirements. All these things taken collectively, are they going to have, if, if we adopt all of them as written, are they going to have any impacts? And I think that it's, it's not an illegitimate uh, position to take that oh, there could be impacts on greenhouse gases, there could be impact on environment, depending on how, how it's structured. I, I think, I don't agree that it's potentially significant. I, I think everything, if it's mitigated, it'll be less than significant, but it all depends on the mitigation. So in, in that case, that's where I would change that too. But I, so, I, well, Madam I, Chair, I if I may, uh, yeah, this I was going to ask a question, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah this is <laughs> this, this checklist is from 2013, so we cannot change it. First of all, so and you have to look at the housing element is a policy document. So you're right. looking at CEQA programmatically, yes. and as stated, um, this is not a project specific. CEQA document. For example, when I was talking about those three sites that we're going to identify to make them by right, we're going to do a full analysis, and a full CEQA analysis. It'll be either a mitigated negative deck or an environmental impact report if that's required. So all this is doing is, is this is looking at the 2013 negative declaration that we cannot change, so get that out of your head. It's a reference. Um, but we're using that, we're relying on that former document. We go through the analysis of all the policies. That's what um, Commissioner List was, was referencing, is all of the changes then from the 2013-21 uh, housing element to this new one. And does it really affect anything? In staff's opinion, it doesn't. If you feel that it does, and that pushes into a mitigated ne negative declaration that we're gonna have to go back prepare the CEQA document, recirculate, and, and then we'll have to come back to you. One thing I want my commissioners to understand is that the piece of property I was talking about on the corner of Cold Springs and Middletown Road is, is off the table as far as we're concerned. Okay. That, that yeah. project has a, had an environmental document prepared and, and adopted for it, a mitigated negative declaration was prepared specifically for that project. And it is not coming back to us in any form. That's what we were told. The environmental document came before you and you provided a recommendation to city council when the action was taken on that zone, zone change and general plan amendment. What you are referring to is the physical development. No, that will not come back before you because it's it's a ministerial permit now under the HO. Right. If if that's what you're referring to, then it's it's the the design of the structures, the layout, the landscaping, provided that they meet the uh, conditions of approval as set forth in the environmental document and the conditions of approval on the entire in the entitlement for that location, that HO overlay. And my point is, I, I think it was my second year or first year as a, as a commissioner, and it kind of went over my head. And, and then having the police chief tell me, no, it's not going to have any impact on the community. And, I'm, and I have battled with this that I can't believe that you can put 75 or 100 extreme low-cost housing units on a piece of property and have no impact on policing. I guess not I in would... my world. 
I guess I would just point out that this document is not providing any entitlements. That particular project was a project specific development that came that came before you and also went to council was a general plan amendment and a rezone environmental document was prepared and that's that ship was sailed if you will and it's not it's it's not the same as this this, this is a policy document so we're looking at it at a programmatic level a policy level this document is not entitling any property I, I understand that yeah I, I guess my point to the Commission is we need to be very careful when we look at these things to really understand the impact it's going to have on our community and, and I think we failed our community um, in in 2013 I'm, I'm finished we can move on um, if I may if it makes you you know feel a little bit more comfortable those three again those we are looking at three sites that we will and we'd like to entitle to make it um, more advantageous for a developer to come in and develop that property all of that entitlement process will come before you so we'll come with with the development um, uh, guide uh, uh, the objective design standards and the secret document that will accompany then the general plan amendment and rezone to entitle that property and all that comes before you and be aired out at a project specific level Do you have any further I'm done. questions? Um, thank moving you. on to Commissioner Keating. Oh, thank you. Um, I have very few few comments. Um, I uh, appreciate the staff's work to um, update the uh, housing element and uh, clearly lay out the programs that uh, are being continued, modified, and then the new programs. Uh, there are 15 new programs that are going to be uh, undertaken by staff in the future to uh, mostly to promote fair housing. My only uh, additional comments rev um, are in regard to the response from the letter, Department of Housing and Community Development that was sent on the 13th of July, um, sent to uh, Director uh, Rivas. In the attachment to that letter, um, the reviewers emphasized uh, particularly, and we've, we've gone over the importance already of um, the fair housing, the AFFH uh, laws, uh, but I just wanted to bring to your attention um, the last statement, goals and actions. This, the reviewer uh, emphasized that the um, housing element needs to have metrics and milestones uh, as appropriate to address um, a lot of fair housing concerns. I won't uh, read verbatim what the reviewer wrote. And the only thing that I would ask of uh, the staff, if it's not uh, an additional burden, would be to transfer, let's see, over, we, we have this, uh, we have our, our policy and then we have our background re report wherein we have the, uh, the programs described uh, that are going to be continued. And um, just quickly, in the assessment written by the consultant uh, BAE, their table 15, and let me, sorry, I lost my um, marker for that. Did you say D is in dog eight? I'm sorry? B. Did you say D is in dog eight or? B. B. B, okay. the uh, consultant's report. And I believe it is. I think it's table B84. Page B84 is table 15. Okay. Okay. B84, I. Okay. I'm going to direct the readers to table 18 on B94, B as in boy, 94, um, where they list the city's uh, fair housing goals, policies, and programs that have uh, been described in uh, the implementation plan. And my only request is that just to facilitate uh, 
the review by uh, the state, the DHC, and also to make it possibly a little more accessible to the public to to understand the progress that uh, the city is making to more clearly state what's a, a metric and a milestone. And the reason I, I say that is that uh, the reviewer said actions must have metrics and milestones. So to me, that was a, a flag. The state is very concerned about the progress that any jurisdiction is making. And, and I, um, I understand that they have a, a standard approach to these housing elements. And uh, Placerville is a very small portion of the SACOG planning area, and we have to keep that in mind. Still, if we can facilitate the review of our housing element and make it a little bit easier for the public to understand the progress that the city is making with their programs, I, I just think that benefits everyone. So um, it's a, a mixed, mixed bag um, in our implementation plan. I, th I think uh, the metrics and milestones in many cases are uh, part of the title, and so it's kind of inferred. But if there was a way to make those metrics a little more obvious, or not obvious, but make them stand out a little bit more so that in our future reviews, we can more quickly say, yes, you know, we made progress with a particular program, or uh, perhaps a, an outreach program wasn't targeted uh, as specifically as it could have been and, and needs more improvement. Um, that's the only comment I have. I think it's uh, a very in informational document, uh, very uh, complete, and tells so much about our uh, community. Um, thank you. All right. Um, so I just had one question that I wanted to ask related to the public input that we did receive. Um, so it was their question or sort of comment on number five, page 4-7, um, related to the fact that we do not allow room and board houses in Placerville. And so I do know that we allow a single residency occupancy, which my understanding is six or more units, fundamentally the, the same thing, just more units, mm -hmm. um, but we don't allow five or fewer units. And I wanted to understand the rationale behind that. Interesting, looking at the 1990, 1991 uh, comprehensive update to the zoning ordinance, which was done immediately after the city adopted the general plan, the 1990 general plan. Staff did look into this issue or question um, specifically because the, the, the staff report and or the, the housing element described that there currently are no zoning districts that permit that use. And so we did look into that. What's interesting, you'll find interesting, is that in the 1963 code that existed until the city did that comprehensive update in 1991, there were two zoning districts, actually three, three zoning districts that permitted that use by right, two of which were multifamily zones. One of them was a commercial zone that doesn't exist anymore. What was clear after actually the director and I kind of looked at the, at the file is there was some interplay between the planning commission and city staff prior to the commission offering a recommendation to city council. Now, we do not know the reasons. I, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I can't give you the reason why they chose to, but apparently there was one communication communicate from the director at the time who was summarizing in a memo the changes that the planning commission recommended. And those changes clearly show on one of the pages X across the entire, where, where they wanted things to be deleted. This was perhaps before, this was done on, well before word processing. So this is the way they handled removing text that they didn't want. So my point in saying that, it, there was some sort of discussion amongst the commission at the time to remove that use from the zone. Not remove the, the definition, it's still in the code. But what we don't know is the reason why it was removed. 
We could speculate, Pierre and I could speculate what that may be based on the time, the time frame. Um, so I don't have an answer for as to why, <laughs> but clearly there was direction by the commission at that time. And then ultimately council did adopt those changes. So uh, it, it clearly, the definition clearly is five or fewer. Now, I could, I could tell you that under, under current housing law, if six, actually six, six people who are unrelated to one another can live in a dwelling, and the city would have to treat that as a, as a residence. We cannot regulate whether or not they're related or not. That can no longer be done. So I don't know whether that had anything to do with it. I don't know if it dates back that far. But uh, uh, there, there was a conscious decision to remove that use from, from the site, or from the, the zoning code. Now, Pierre and I have, have talked about that, and, and because our definition uses the word lodging, clearly that's a temporary type of uh, accommodation. It's not, that otherwise you would perhaps use a different term, a different word. Yep. Um, Therefore, the city could certainly look at maybe those uses being permitted in zoning districts like commercial zones where lodging is allowed. That, I guess that would be our, well, go ahead. Yeah, the only additional comments I would make is, um, I guess, and at least it was our conclusion that a boarding house is more of a commercial than a residential use. It's more of a lodging facility than providing a place for people to live. So it's like a very much larger version of say, a short-term rental would be, or a short-term rental. It could be, you know, one, the, the, it could be a studio apartment or, or a house where usually these boarding houses are large homes. Looking at the definition, basically a boarding house is a house providing food and lodging for paying guests. Well, that's outside of the scope of what we're doing here in the housing element. And so I think there could have been, and we tried to speculate looking back in the past, why was it excluded? It could be uh, because they're very, very difficult to regulate. It could be because if somebody owns a large house in a residential zone, then when, when does it become a boarding house? How does staff uh, determine whether or not some guests are long-term guests, you know, greater than 30 days versus under 30 days. And then you get into the problem of defining a family, which um, a court case in the past said we cannot do. Um, it used to be that you could regulate the number of unrelated persons living in a house. Um, jurisdictions can't do that anymore. There is a relic in our, uh, in our residential zones that said you're allowed to rent one room in your house. Well, if somebody rents a house that's four bedrooms, they can have additional roommates and the city can't regulate that. So I think that's why the boarding house uh, was removed for probably a number of reasons, but a boarding house um, in, 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 in relation to the comment we received yeah. would be outside of the scope of the housing element okay. because it's more of a, it's, it, it, it's sort of like a, a, a type of hotel or it's more like a, a larger bed and breakfast. Okay, thank you. Um, I, had, I had no other comments. So on, on that last note, on the bed and breakfast, um, and I, okay, here we are. Uh, page eight, goal E, this is in the uh, addendum. This is one of the things that uh, I know we're gonna change that uh, prohibit transient short-term rentals in residential zones unless the unit is owner occupied. So that gets us to the, this whole, we have bed and breakfasts already, right? There's a lot of famous bed and breakfasts in, in town. And, and so somebody lives there, right? The, the Airbnb, I, the term Airbnb, does that ex really, is that really defined as the owner does not, is not present? Um, I, I don't, <clears throat> because we have bed and breakfast, which is okay, but then there's this term Airbnb, which is, that's a, company, frankly. Yeah, bed it's and like, breakfast is different. I guess I, w I, w I would define a bed and breakfast as usually they're, they're a large house where the city allows them under our code. There's 16 right. 
criteria that are that's codified that they have to meet that the house must be historic as one and then it goes through a whole number and that the uh, owner proprietor must live on the premises and typically even though the code doesn't explicitly say it um, breakfast is provided to the guests I've stayed in bed and breakfast you know many times in the past I'm sure some of you have sure I always got breakfast yes I think when and and there was the short-term rentals I'll call them uh, started in the Tahoe Basin uh, as our earlier speaker was talking about before Airbnb Airbnb and and some of those other um, platforms on the internet is just a substitute from when you used to advertise your short-term rental in the local newspaper so if some of you remember, I remember when Airbnb first came out, and they would show a family. They would talk about the, the, uh, the, the parents and their, their kids went away to school, and they have this house now with extra rooms. What could they do? Well, you can bring people over from Europe and have that exchange of ideas and cultures and, and all that sort of thing. Well, it became very lucrative then for investors to actually uh, target um, – uh, tourist destinations such as Lake Tahoe and you can buy a house and you can probably uh, charge uh, and get more money for uh, renting it out on a weekend on a short-term basis uh, than maybe you could renting it out um, on, on a year-to-year -year basis or, or a month-to-month -month -month basis month, yeah. and, and pay your mortgage and so the way staff looks at this, and right now we currently do not allow short-term rentals in single-family zones. It's, it's not allowed. Uh, staff has been directed by council to come back with an ordinance to look at maybe allowing it in circ certain circumstances. For example, um, in many cities you'll have where um, what was previously a residential area has gone commercial over time and you may have you know, a relic house here or there. Well, if somebody owns a commercial property with a house on it that could have a motel or hotel, then, you know, staff feels that that would be appropriate for that then to be a short-term rental. So we're going to be putting together an ordinance. That ordinance will come before you, and it's sort of separate from the housing element. The reason why we just have it in here is because the state has been really trying to... Um, allow for the creation of ADUs, accessory dwelling units. And so the state has been imposing a lot of requirements and on local jurisdictions to make them more affordable to build. And they're doing that by saying, you're gonna have to proportionally reduce impact fees and do a lot of other things like reduce development uh, standards and, and, and the like. Well, we certainly wanna do that because I think um, second residential units, granny flats, or whatever you wanna call them, are a way of creating affordable housing. But we want to give those incentives to people that want to build housing, not lodging. And I think that's the reason why we're being a little more affirmative on that. That's a good statement. Because it's a commercial use. And the commercial use shouldn't get the benefit then of reduction in fees to tie into the city's water system and sewer system and all of that to create a commercial kind of a situation as opposed to affordable housing. Uh, and I will add to that. Unfortunately, the state requires us to, the, to, the, to do the enforcement to ensure that it's not being rented as a short-term rental. Right. I think Pierre and I, I think I could speak for Pierre, and, and he and I would, would both concur that we wish the legislature would do more and actually penalize somebody from doing that, put it as a, uh, a violation of state law. Therefore, it may have more... Um, disincentive imposed with that than perhaps a monetary sanction or something that we might be able to impose. But that likely would in involve a lot, a lot more lobbying and uh, perhaps other jurisdictions. We, we can't be in the same boat. I mean, with, uh, we can't be dissimilar to other jurisdictions who, are, uh, who have, have many more vacation rentals than we do or short-term rentals than we do. Um, I can only imagine what they're going through during their housing element process where they are losing housing uh, to in a short-term way and you know their workforce either has to commute longer distances to 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 do the work that they do in the town so anyway I'll I'll stop talking 
So very quickly, uh, Program 12, I will, would like to go on record as saying I totally support the concept of the workforce housing and making that a priority. I think that's a benefit to the community. It's a benefit uh, to the employers. It's a bit, just a benefit all the way around. So really happy to see that in there. Then on Program 11, Senior Housing, I, I just want to quibble a bit, if I may, on the logic. I'm looking in the discussion, and it's talking about, it says, uh, about the fourth, third line down, much of this growth will be the result of in-migration from the surrounding areas. And it goes down to say, uh, we talk about people retiring, though many initially buy homes, the maintenance responsibilities may become too burdensome as they continue to age. Granted. And the households may offer smaller senior housing units, including assisted living complexes. So, but that's to me says these people have got equity, they've got money. So I don't understand where we then go on to say the city will identify potential funding sources and work with nonprofits to facilitate development of affordable housing. Those aren't the people we need to be developing affordable housing for. They moved here, retired here, then they sold their home and they maybe they took their one-time exemption then they have all this equity I, I i didn't like i didn't like the logic in this uh, certainly i could agree that there probably needs to be the development of affordable senior housing okay but, but the the logic of this i i didn't think uh didn't tie well to me so and in terms of protecting city dollars what we should we should be seeking funding for, et cetera. It's not for people, you know, uh, I'm getting close to that crowd, I think, you know. So, yeah, hey, I'll take the money, find me some funding. So, yeah. anyway, and that's really all I had. I'm really excited about the document. Uh, my approach, frankly, on this was I looked for changes from the previous document is kind of how I focused my review as opposed to going through everything necessarily uh, as much detail. And there were a few things that I'm looking forward to the implementation because the devil is in the detail when the rubber meets the road, as it were. And thank you so much. Sure. In, in response to that, yeah, the word affordable is, is a good qualifier. Um, and I, I cannot recall whether or not we use that term in the the new policy or the continued policy to have to look it up. Uh, but in order for someone to qualify for um, financing for affordability, they would have to show in their application to the state that either a percentage of or all of the units would have to be affordable. So the city necessarily wouldn't be advocating for, as you, as you, 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 you mentioned. Uh, those folks that are or a development project for a market rate and above type of a complex I think what this language is is trying to assist uh, yeah, affordable units so actually that term does make sense and we we, we will certainly can certainly put that in there if that helps to clarify, clarify no, my, my issue was just kind of the, the logic I totally agree with the affordable the, the scenario that you, you built, I don't think was the best scenario to justify it. it that's a minor quibble, okay. just for that. So, Madam Chair, I believe there's action that we need to be taking on this. Uh, yes, if anybody would like to make a motion. I'd be, fall, I'd be willing to make the motion that we afford a recommendation of the City Council to approve an addendum to the 2013-2021 General Plan of Housing Element Negative Declaration for the 2021-2029 housing element and to adopt GPA 20-01 adopting a comprehensive update of the housing element of the City of Plattsville General Plan making the findings as uh, described on page 7 of the staff report 1A, B, and C and uh, incorporating the staff report as a matter of record. I'll second. I have a question. Um, I don't think I heard you uh, clearly. Uh, you did include forwarding this to the city council. Yes, I started off. You with started that. with yes. Okay. Well, I, I, I rec recommend to the city council to approve. Yeah. So okay. If, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, roll call vote, please. If there's no further questions, comments. Member Friend. Aye. Member List. Aye. Vice Chair Gottberg. Aye. Member Keeney. Aye. 
I enjoyed the discussion. All right. So we are now moving on to new business. Do we have any new business to attend to? Uh, no, we do not. Okay, so then moving on to matters from commissioners and staff. Does staff have any items to report to us? I do want to, or we need to let you know that the council will consider your recommendation on the fifth Tuesday of this month, which is the 31st. To, to ensure that uh, if the council needs additional time to, for us to make changes to it, to a document that they need, it need, they need to adopt by September the 12th. Um, that's, that's the reason for the special meeting because, because their regular meeting would be after that date. What this means for the Planning Commission is that right now we want to keep the Tuesday, the September 7th, availability of the City Council to use this, this space here, their, their regular meeting location, should they need it. So what that means to you is that we will not have a meeting. The regular meeting for the Planning Commission, the first one in September, will not be, will not be held. <laughs> Any questions about that? Okay. Um, we do expect items for the second meeting. Um, we are kind of pushing those projects or holding them back, I guess would be the better term, until the, the housing element gets through its its processes. So um, bear with us um, and thank you. Director Rivas, do you have any anything to add? Uh, just a couple of items. Uh, the council at that special meeting on the 31st will be considering actually three items. So I was, it's always nervous when you try and get a special meeting for one thing. So they're gonna be considering, I believe they're gonna be considering the um, it'll be the homeless uh, camp that there that the city is looking at doing uh, in concert with the county it's a piece of property that's actually it's county property next to the uh, county jail and then the other item I think is uh, um, the ARPA funding that the city is getting one point something million dollars so the city's gonna be looking at how to spend that that money so those are the actually the three items the council will be considering on the 31st if you're interested with regards to that first item and the the, the homeless project mm -hmm. is that going to be supervised yes it is going to be supervised it is going to be supervised okay that that's excellent i mean i, yeah. I, I think this is just a, a great step in the yeah, right it's direction. a managed uh, Fan, camp. Man, I, I was wondering about that i meant been meaning to ask uh, yeah i read that. that that's terrific yeah it's basically a means of you know because of course you know the homeless they have, they, they are individuals with constitutional rights and so um it puts it puts local governments um in sort of a quandary of how to manage individuals where they're just in a lot of different places a lot of these places we don't want them to be for example in um in uh environmentally sensitive areas like our creeks we'd like to get them out of there or on certain hillsides where it's not really an advantageous uh to have a camp so at least this is a site uh, that seems to be a little bit better located where it will be managed. The whole concept is to try and um, assist these folks and get them out of homelessness. So, uh, and that's sort of the program. I'm not personally, you know, heavily involved in it, but that's my understanding and I hope it's a success because we all know that it, the, the situation is, is dire yes. out there. And, and all some of the, some of these fires that we have are due to the homeless camps and you know the threat of fire is very i know puts the fear in me that's for sure um let me see what else oh i want to let you know that um, staff did receive i would just call it a preliminary submittal of site plans and elevations for the i would just call it the gateway hotel it's going to have its own name. Um, that's the one up there on in Smith Flat, Point View Drive, and Jake Way. So that'll be a boutique hotel. It'll be one of a kind, and so we're very excited about that. So uh, once I we take a good look at it and we tell them it looks good to us, they're going to submit the formal application, 
And so that site plan review will come before you, and you'll get a chance then to take a look and and hopefully approve a new hotel for, for the city. And the last thing I want to say, um, really, I just want I just want to publicly comment uh, city planner Andrew Painter and what was a Herculean effort. He managed this this pro uh, project. I think the whole staff had a hand on it, but this is primarily work you see of, of Mr. Painter, and I just want to publicly thank him for a tremendous amount of work here. Uh, the, the document is quite large, much bigger than the previous housing element, mainly because of the fair housing assessment and other requirements of the state on the city. But um, I think he handled it really, really well, including the comments with HCD, and hopefully he'll have a feather in his cap and he'll have a certified housing element. So thank you, Andrew. Oh, thank, you. And thank you, Commission. <laughs> well played, well played. Thank you. On, on that regard, thank you very much. On that regard, um, we. I think we mentioned to some of you when you arrived today that if you if you know some typos and things like that that always get overlooked, if you could just jot those down, email those to us. Those aren't substantive changes. They're just, you know, we can mention one that most of you <laughs> already know about. Um, but I, I'll refrain, but unless Director Rivas wants us to mention it. Um, we, we, uh, well, we might as well do it. We, we misspelled uh, the mayor's name. <laughs> We misspelled the mayor's name. So um, he has yet to comment on that. And so uh, I want to let you know that we, we went down to the courthouse and we legally changed his name back from, <laughs> from Donis to back to Dennis. So he should be, uh, he'll give us a thank you for that. <laughs> we will certainly make that correction before it goes in front of them in a couple of weeks. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for the public. Their input during the questionnaires during COVID was was essential. Um, yeah, we kind of wish maybe we, we could have had more activities for them to get involved with, but uh, we are we we're here we're we're here because of of a lot of factors. And um, any thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, members of the public. If you're out there, um, we appreciate your time. You certainly have the ability to comment at the council level, so if those of you who were not able to come tonight, you certainly can do that, express your opinion, get yourself on record, and um, thank you. Come on, folks, he's looking for the criticism. He wants the challenge. <laughs> are, are there any matters from commissioners? All right. I uh, call adjournment of the August 17th, 2021 meeting of the Placerville Planning Commission at 8.03. Well played, Madam Chair.